Hello, everybody. Um, this is a live online class, and it's tips on performing a, a mold inspection. <clears throat> it's a live online class, so if you're live right now, we have about 100 people registered for the class. You can ask questions during this live class, and you do that by clicking this um, icon here. Let's see if I can, there it is. So at the top right corner of your window screen, somewhere around there, your video screen, you should see nine little squares. You click one of those, and then um, that gets you to the questions and answers. There's a QA button right there. And so you can ask questions at any time. And the class doesn't start for another three minutes. So I started the class a little bit early. And while I have you, um, let me take you to a URL where we have um, a registration page for the next upcoming free live online class. That's at nachi.org forward slash webinar. That's N-A-C-H-I dot org forward slash webinar. And if you go there, we also have video recordings of past classes, previous classes. So you can click any one of those. And we have many to choose from. And they're all online videos and open to everyone. So go to forward slash natchi.org forward slash webinar. And there you'll find all of those training videos. So officially, the class starts in about one minute, just going over a few things. If you wanted to ask questions during the class, um, there is a, an, an icon, a nine square icon at the top right corner right now at this Google Hangout event. And you click that and you get to the QA button. You can ask questions. Just a few things. You should be able to see me. I cannot see you. You should be able to hear me. Hello, hello, hello. Um, I cannot hear you. So if you get on, you can hear me and see me. Uh, you can tell me that by using that question and answer box. And today's class is live online. You can ask questions. It will also be recorded at the same link that you use to get here. There'll be a video recording of this class. And we'll also announce it in our monthly newsletter. InterNACHI has a monthly newsletter for home inspectors. So subscribe to that newsletter. And today's class is about tips on performing a mold inspection. My name is Ben. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors, world's largest organization of residential and commercial property inspectors. We train and certify inspectors all over the world. And if you need to contact me or anyone at InterNACHI, go to our contact page, and that's at the bottom there. That's at natchi.org forward slash contact. And there you'll find everybody on staff. And today we'll concentrate on the non-invasive visual examination of the readily accessible and installed systems and components listed in the IAC2 Mold Inspection Standards of Practice. Well, what's that? Well, let's go there. So IEC2 stands for, let's open this up a little bit, International Association of Certified Indoor Air Consultants. If you'd like to be a member of IAC2, um, the application process is fairly easy. However, you have to be a member of InterNACHI. That's one of the requirements. And then there's some training involved in certification exam. You can apply online. And um, the standards of practice are there, the mold inspection standards of practice for completing 
both a complete mold inspection and a limited visual inspection. So in most cases, if visible mold growth is present, sampling is really unnecessary. And that's really true. That's what basically the EPA and a lot of experts say. I mean, if you see indications of visible mold growth um, and it's and there's moisture intrusion, a moisture problem, then you really don't have to sample. If it's small, EPA says around 10 square feet or smaller, then the homeowner can basically clean it up. If it's bigger than that, you should probably hire a professional. So a tip on performing a mold inspection is that sampling, anybody could sample. Sampling is easy. You get one of these things. As a home inspector, I actually carry a swab. If I see something, I turn around to my client. I tell them what I observe, indications of moisture intrusion and mold growth and conditions gr conducive to mold growth. We could sample this, or it may be unnecessary. It's kind of small, so it could just be cleaned up, which typically re re um, requires removal of building materials. And um, if you happen to sample it, great, we'll have laboratory results. But before, it, regardless of the sampling results and whether or not um, building materials are removed or not, um, there's one thing that is most important, is critical to performing a mold inspection. It's not sampling. Anybody could do sampling. It's easy. It's finding moisture. It's the moisture intrusion need a few things for mold to grow. Spores, they're all over the place. Good temperature, in between, not too cold, not too hot. You need moisture, S something to grow on some substrate, but you need moisture. So if you're good, if you're a good mold inspector, you're actually a great moisture intrusion inspector. If you're interested in additional training, InterNACHI has a ton of building science training and mold inspection training. We go down to each popular, most common sampling device, swabs, pumps, dishes, and tools, infrared, moisture meters, invasive, non-invasive probes. And one of them is this online video co course. It's all online, and it's all video, and it's free to every member of InterNACHI. See, when you're a member of InterNACHI, you join as a member. You don't have to become a home inspector. Just join as a member. And when you're a member of InterNACHI, a whole world of opportunity opens up for you. You can join monthly or yearly, and you have access to all of the online training that InterNACHI provides. All of it. It's available to a member of InterNACHI, so join as a member. And this video um, training course is really good. I kind of love it. And um, we've got, we have really good feedback on it. And uh, I do some instructions. We actually do a moisture inspection with an infrared camera and moisture meter. We have chief mycologist, Dr. Shane from ProLab down in Florida, comes out, takes a look at all of the components and, and how to um, take sampling. And we actually do um, a mold inspection with sampling. But in this course, we're going to, this class, we're going to do the, essentially concentrate on the non-invasive visual examination of the components listed within the standards of practice. Again, if you're a great mold inspector, you're an awesome moisture intrusion inspector because that's the most critical part of performing a mold inspection, finding moisture. If you find mold, great. You're going to fix it. There's one thing you got to do before you fix it. You have to fix the moisture problem because we all know that there's some kind of moisture problem in the home. Right? It could be moisture intrusion or it could be like an interior air quality issue. And we have training and certification available if you're a member of InterNACHI 
online and free to members, to become a moisture intrusion inspector, online training and certification. We also have a, a mold inspector certification, a training and certification program, and it's all online and free to members. We actually have over 30 certifications to choose from. You join as a member, you don't have to become a, a home inspector, but you join as a member, you have access to all this training, and you pick and choose which program you want. You wanna be a, um, a green building inspector? Well, you just pick and choose that. And all that training and certification is online. Again, free online live classes just like this one at natcha.org forward slash webinar. They used to be webinars. A mold inspection is valid for the date of the inspection and can't predict anything in the future, right? It's kind of like a home inspection disclaimer. Because mold conditions, because conditions conducive to mold growth in a building can vary greatly over time, the results of a mold inspection can only be relied upon for the point in time when I was doing the inspection, right? Who knows what happens tomorrow? Rainstorm could come. Moisture intrusion could begin. 24 hours later, you have conditions conducive to mold growth. We have a mold waiver, which is a document you ask your client to sign. And it is free to members. You download it. You can give it to your client. It's also uh, integrated with our online agreement system. And it's a document that explains to your client you're doing a home inspection. Mold is not within the scope of a home inspection. And they are not asking you to perform a mold inspection at this time. And they have, you have it signed. Now, later on, after you do a, a home inspection, two years later, if they happen to find mold problems in the home, you can come to this document and say, well, you signed the document saying, I was performing a home inspection. Home inspections do not include mold inspections. And you asked me not to perform a mold inspection at that time. So that may help you. And that's at natchi.org forward slash, natchi.org forward slash mold waiver. That's also a document within your InterNACHI membership account, your online account. Every member has an online account. A mold inspection report should include the following. Describing the moisture intrusion problem, because you've got to have that for you to have mold. Um, or con conditions conducive to mold growth. Water damage. If you see water damage, you should put that in the report. If you smell odors, that could be an indication of conditions conducive to mold growth. If you observe mold or indications of mold growth, you should put that in an inspection report. And then at the end, if you do laboratory results, if you do a sampling, you put the laboratory results in there. The most you could say about the laboratory results is that some people are going to be sensitive to mold. It's not like radon. Radon is pretty much quantifiable. There's a level that's been drawn. Mold is um, not that um, clear to everyone, right? So if you find mold, your client may be sensitive to that, should be cleaned up. What you really are concentrated on is the moisture intrusion. Again, if you're a good mold inspector, anybody can sample mold. Homeowners can sample mold. There's mold all over, but there's mold on my shirt. Mold spores are all over, indoor, outdoor. There's concentrated levels, there's lower levels. But what's really important is that moisture intrusion. So let's concentrate on doing a non-invasive visual examination of the readily accessible installed systems and components listed in the standards of practice. And they include the roof. Yeah, you have to inspect the roof. You don't have to get on the roof. Not required during a home inspection. You're not required to step on any roof surface. Same thing with the mold inspection standards of practice. You're not required to get on the roof, but you have to inspect it. Why? Because there could be a condition conducive to mold growth happening on that roof. It could be starting at the roof, right? You got to start where the rain begins, hitting the structure. Inspect the exterior, the foundation, HVAC, attic, 
and interior. Oh, plumbing, attic, and interior. Um, I often find indications of moisture intrusion at the electrical box, the panel inside the home. Moisture follows the uh, overhead conductors coming down, maybe into the meter itself, into the line, into the home. So always take a look at that as well. Um, we don't have to open up any dead front covers. So the inspector shall inspect from ground level or eaves, the roof covering, roof drainage system, including gutters and downspouts, the vents, flashing, skylights, chimneys, and other roof penetrations. Uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask questions at any time. And let me go back here before we start and make sure you see that icon, the nine square icon at the top right corner somewhere on your window screen. You can click that and get to the QA um, feature, that button, click that button, you can ask questions. So let's do a, um, a mold inspection, which starts with the roof. You gotta inspect the roof. I am trained to walk upon the roof surface safely. Um, came from the trades, installing roofs, very familiar with it. Follow safety procedures. So I inspect the roof from the roof. Uh, let my client know that as well. I get real close. I'm looking for anything that allows water to penetrate into the building through the envelope, through the exterior siding materials, through the roof covering materials. And here's one. So the roof covering materials is great, but this vent flashing apparently was installed afterwards or it leaked after it was installed and they came by and put this band-aid. You never goop, this is a temporary patch. Never goop roofing tar in large quantities upon a roof. It's just not, unless you have some kind of flat roof, right? Then yeah, then you'll be using this material a lot. And it's cracked there. Um, I don't spend, waste really time I'm drawing arrows and circling things in my report. I just use my finger real quick. And I'm looking at the ventilation. I want to make sure that that attic space is ventilated. This is a cold, cold climate, so the roof um, could use some ventilation. And the flashing materials, some more patchwork. Just confirming that there's step flashing. There's no drip edge. That's in my report. I'm thinking of how moisture moves around a building, hits the roof, slopes away, it's caught, maybe not, in a gutter system that's functional, it's gotta take that, all that hundreds of gallons of water during a typical rainstorm away from the building. Downspouts, splash blocks, diverted away, sloped grating around the house, and there's vents, vents on the soffits. I'm look, also looking around the exterior siding materials, looking at how well the water, uh, the components are flashed and how the water is diverted away. Looking for sealant, openings, any kind of opening in the exterior that it would allow moisture to intrude into the building, to enter into the building. The gutters need to be cleaned. The exterior ground, so that's about it for the roof. I take a bunch of pictures. I also take a bunch of photographs um, and video, sorry. A bunch of images, maybe a hundred pictures of the roof. Almost every step that I take, I'm taking a picture of something. Anything I touch, if I'm bending over and looking at something in detail, I'm taking a picture of that. Just extra pictures. And then I move on to the next system. By the time before I touch the ground, I am already done with my roof system and writing the report using a software with a mobile device. It comes in really handy. I don't have to remember everything that I saw during the inspection, mold inspection, when I got home or at my home office or, or in the truck. So I write as I inspect. I take pictures as I inspect. Yep. The exterior and grounds, that's the next system for performing a mold inspection. And the inspector shall inspect the gr from ground level the cladding, the exterior siding materials, the flashing, the trim, the exterior doors, windows, decks, stoops, steps, stairs, porches, railings, eaves, soffit, fascia, the exterior grading around the building perimeter, and anything that penetrates the exterior siding or covering materials. And I take a lot of pictures. 
while I'm going around. And I'm really expect inspecting for sloped grading, and I'm imagining how water runs down the building siding, looking at all the different components that touch, that come in contact with each other. See how those different building materials expand and contract differently, how masonry comes in contact with aluminum siding. They expand and contract differently, and I want some kind of sealant right there. So there's been some patching of that sealant at that area. And there's some separation. This is um, decorative only. The brick goes all the way behind, but still that could be sealed up. I turn on anything that um, has water supplied to it, like an exterior water faucet. I don't turn on often on shutoff valves, but if it's a faucet, a fixture, um, I'll turn the water on. A drip at a faucet can cause a lot of damage. If it's not frost free and it bursts open, we can have water penetration into the building interior in cold climates. Um, ventilation of drier exhausts um, is very important. That has to be discharged outside. And I follow the electric line. I tend to follow the electric line through the building materials into the house interior. That is sometimes a pathway for moisture intrusion. And in this home, we actually did have some water coming into the electrical panel. And I saw indications, observed indications, of water intrusion inside the panel. You're not required to remove the dead front cover, but I did here. Actually, it caused rust inside the panel. Again, looking at every component of the exterior particularly where different materi materials intersect and interact with each other. Um, at the entry tread, there's masonry brick that is loose. And right there is a great place for moisture to get in. Under windows, I look at the top corners, bottom corners, and the bottom sill of every window and door. It's the same thing. It's, the, it's, a, it's a square opening inside the building envelope. Top corners, bottom corners, and the sill, the bottom part. And right there at the door tread is a great place for moisture intrusion. So when I'm in the crawl space, maybe it's a slab on grade. I know this is the basement. When I'm in the basement, I want to go underneath every window at the band rim joist and probe and observe and look, maybe measure for moisture, looking for any indications of moisture intrusion. And under doors and window treads, um, that's... Fantastic place to look. Settlement of things that should be properly sloped away, hard surfaces that should be sloped away from the house uh, is important to observe. Plus it's also a trip hazard. Driveways, walkways, anything that gets water away from the house or could puddle up. So there's a puddle area in this parking lot. If you needed something um, more than just your images or words and you wanted graphics, illustrations. Internet actually provides that and you can download these for your inspection report. And here's one about swales and you can also download it in high res. You can take that. Every member has access to these illustrations. We have hundreds of illustrations available in our gallery. So you can grab any of those illustrations and um, download them for your inspection report. Some of them are pretty awesome, too. All of them are pretty awesome. Yeah. So that's um, a little tip there for your mold inspection report. Make the mold inspection report very easy to understand, easy to read, clear to understand. So here we have a question. Hi, David. If there is apparent evidence of mold, example, floor joist, flooring in a basement area after slight removal of insulation. Is it advised to go further with the evaluation and tearing out more insulation to get a general idea of the complete area of mold growth? Um, what I would do, the word tearing out pops out in your question, right? So I don't want to tear out anything. What I do is I gently move. As if it were my own home, I treat it. And so I have a, an extendable um, garden hoe with three tines in it, and I use that to extend up and reach, probe, looking for damage, like doing a wood-destroying insect 
inspection. It's a lot about sound. How does the wood component sound? It's the same thing with the moisture intrusion inspection. How does the wooden component sound? You can almost tell, can't quantify it, but you can almost tell the moisture content of wood just by tapping it. There's also a prick test, but I try not to do any of that. I'm just pro probing my probe, moving insulation and putting it back, moving insulation and putting it back, moving, putting it back. It's kind of like when I'm in the attic, I tend to lift insulation, look underneath, put it back, lift and put it back. If I find those areas, if I find one area, I'm going left and right, up and down. It's usually a, if it's a band joist, right, I'm going where I'm following the floor joist component but sometimes it's a band seal, so it spreads typically along the, the length of the wooden component, the board. Water travels that way, so it'll spread out that way. So I'm looking at the band rim joist. It, it has to jump towards the floor joist and, and migrate, right? So it's probably not going to be above my head. It's in the nooks and crannies and corners that I want to look. I'm looking for mold, right? I'm doing a mold inspection, but I'm essentially really looking for the condition conducive to mold growth. I can sample, it's very easy, but if you have evidence of mold and you show your client, this is what I see, they will typically say, well, should I test? You can pull out a swab if you'd like and confirm it. Do an air sampling if you'd like. But what they really want to know, what my clients are really asking me is, where's the water problem? Right? So I don't tear out like you, like you asked. Um, I grab, move, and put back. You never know. No one will ever know that I was there. That's how you should handle that. I hope I answered your question, David. Uh, so the exterior is really important. How does the wa um, exterior siding shed, divert water away from the structure? Some exterior siding materials, stucco, looks like a really great surface, but those, that system could have a crack that a lot, that if you add up the crack, it's a huge hole that allows water to penetrate into the building. Um, I inspect the decks because they're attached. I don't really care about mold um, or, or uh, water stains on the deck itself, but it's really the, the ledger board where the deck attaches to the home, there should be flashing properly installed. This is a common problem in climates where there's rainfall, a lot of rainfall. And if it's, um, and this is coming from Pennsylvania, if it's in the Northeast and the deck is elevated, then it becomes a safety issue as well. So you have to juggle these things. If you find a ledger flashing that is, um, not properly installed, allowing water to penetrate. And if you find structural damage caused by that com missing component or improperly installed component, then you actually have a safety issue. You don't just have moisture or conditions to mold growth, conducive to mold growth, but you actually have a safety issue. Decks can collapse. So there's a bit of an overlap when you do a mold inspection. You could be in a position where you have to comment upon a structural material defect. It's really exciting. That's why I love this business. So take a look at the top part of the flashing, ledger board flashing, the bottom part. You should see the, the bolts and the nuts, right? You don't have to be a deck expert, but what you're really thinking about is how does moisture, um, how is moisture controlled? And here's another um, illustration that you could use in your inspection report. It's in our inspection graphics library. You can download it in high res. Every member of InterNACHI has access to hundreds of these illustrations, 3D illustrations. So this is just one, but we twist this around a little bit and show you all the components. You can pick and choose. We also have one without any words. You can put your own words in there. And there's um, stucco right there that's cracked but has been repaired. So it's um, a repair. Um, it's an ugly repair there. It's cosmetic, really. But what I'm interested in is, um, was there any problems with the deck and the flashing? And did this crack happen because of moisture intrusion? And what does that mean on the inside of the house now? 
So as you're going around the house, after you do about a thousand mold inspections, you get really good. You can remember what you see on the outside and how does that affect things that you observe on the inside. Do you remember the first defect that we found in this mold inspection? Do you remember what it was? You should say, yes, roof. We found a problem on the roof. One of the vent stacks is coming up through the roof and the flashing is uh, in poor condition and allowing water to penetrate into the building interior, into the attic. So now in my head, can't wait to get into the attic. Can't wait to see what's in the attic. Maybe nothing, but that's part of the mold inspection. You have to inspect the roof. You can do it from the ground. Um, any door, I'm looking at the top left, right corners, bottom left, right corners, and the, the very bottom, the seal, the tread, where the sliding door slides. So that's in poor shape, actually. Um, no flashing, and just a lot of silicone. Um, and I'm looking at the downspouts, diverting water away from the house. Next part of the IAC2 standards of practice for performing a mold inspection is the basement foundation crawl space and structure. And you're required to inspect the basement, a foundation basement crawl space, um, including the ventilation and looking for moisture intrusion. So this house was partially vacant, mostly vacant. So it was a great way to see everything in the home. But I had inspection restrictions at the time of the inspection. I wanna make sure that I explain that to my client. I can't see through drop ceilings. There was insulation, stuff that the band rim joist, engineered floor joists, as you can see. So there's a lot of open spaces. And it's very easy to move this insulation. And there's insulation installed on the poured concrete foundation wall and block wall. Uh, sorry, it, it was all block. Uh, it was all block, yeah, concrete block. And as I go around inspecting the foundation, I'm also looking for water stains. Sometimes it's a bucket or a, a paint bucket that's been sitting there for a long time or something from the air conditioner unit, the, the condensate drained. But if there are, well, if there are indications of painting, whitewashing on the foundation wall, um, particularly the wall that's underground, <laughs> um, I'm going to point that out to my client. And I'm actually going to take, I, this is up to you, it's um, at your discretion to take temperature readings. Um, I like to take the temperature reading of the concrete block foundation wall. I want to see if it's cold. If the relative humidity level in the room, and let's say it's a basement room, relative humidity level in the basement room is 70%, and I go over to a, a foundation wall, and it's freezing cold. It's like 40, 50 degrees. Um, that is a condition that's conducive to mold growth. You can have condensation developing. And all that building science stuff with relative humidity uh, moisture content um, and dew point and condensation. Um, we have building science courses that help you understand that. One of them is comfort and climate. Um, the comfort level inside the home relative to the climate. That's a really good one. And indoor air quality is another online course that's free to all members. Um, while I'm doing the inspection, I wanna get behind any finished wall. I wanna crawl around. I wear knee pads throughout the entire inspection so I can get on my knees, around toilets, um, underneath the sink cabinet. I'm looking for anywhere, anything that looks like a water problem, a leak, and I wanna get on my knees. I don't want to say, oh, I have bad knees and I can't get down there. I'm going down there. So I wanna crawl around, get behind the walls, stick my head in things, get in there, and there we go. So I have a concrete block foundation wall. It's covered with insulation, great idea. However, um, we have water intrusion through the concrete block foundation and it's being trapped behind there. You stick your hand behind the insulation and it just comes out wet. And there's black uh, indications of mold growth, that black stuff right there. Um, so I'm pulling back, I'm showing my client what we did. My client is behind my shoulder. I'm taking pictures as I'm inspecting and I'm showing them what I see. 
the in fiberglass insulation is actually stuck on the foundation wall um, in the corner and on the wall itself and on the block and on the mortar joints and in the corners there's water intrusion and where it's easy to get to where it looks nice they they whitewashed it so the seller painted the the um, the wall and uh, to make it look nice great you know um, there's some products out there that claim that they can stop water intrusion so um, I don't know what's going on really but all I know is that water is still coming through the problem is outside essentially that's where the water comes from it is coming through and there's really nothing you can do on the surface like with paint um, and so uh, these things are very difficult to describe with words pictures worth a thousand words so this is a great shot here and even though the grading on the outside of the house could look good there may be um, impervious soil below the grade that can force water to come back to the foundation wall so even though you have a, a sloped grade downspouts extending water can travel water can be wicked up hundreds of feet in a building just go right up um, and we also have a building um, science training on that um, and so when you have masonry underground and there's water on the outside of the building it masonry is like a if it's if it's not coated properly it could be like a sponge like a stone set in a bucket of water that whole stone in an hour will just be wet um, let's see here so there's another graphic sorry that you can add to your inspection report to help explain what might be going on outside underground and so there's my extendable hoe I'm pulling insulation away and putting it back I want to look at that remember that dryer exhaust remember the hood on the outside that's where I want to see I want to make sure that th that dryer exhaust is actually blowing through the the wall the exterior wall going outside and not actually blowing behind the insulation which I've found in the past taking a look at everything this is a little crawl space underneath the the basement landing the stairs I want to take a look above the drop ceiling I take a, a bunch of shots even video of above the ceiling to make sure that there's nothing going on there sometimes there could be a leak that isn't coming through the drop ceiling or the drop ceiling panel was replaced just before I did my inspection I want to see above there as much as I can but also tell my client that it's a really restricted limited inspection can't see everything oh um, Mario asks if you take a lot of pictures how many pictures you include in the report and what do you do with the rest um, there are a couple ways you can uh, handle your images I give them all I'm fairly transparent in my inspections I don't hold back pictures so I download them I used to download them on CD now I would download them or um, somehow transform them over um, as a drop uh, iCloud or something but you can put them on USB so put all your video and all your images on a USB you can buy a USB for a few dollars in bulk and it's really nice to have as a gift to your client here here's all the video and all the images that I took during the inspection in my inspection report you can take a look at a few samples of mine if you'd like um, I try to put in at least 30 to 60 images but my reports are huge my inspection reports they're about 50 to 60 pages my mold reports are about half that so um, images are really important to me and my service it's particularly my brand my brand is who I am defines who I am and how I'm different from all the rest of my competition so I'm known my brand is is includes hundreds of images I take hundreds of images many minutes of video and I provide all of those images to my clients and I put as much of those images in my inspection reports as I can um, time restricting uh, let's see where are we 
Um, we're still in the basement. As you can tell, I've probably in this inspection, I've uh, spent about an hour. Yep. And I haven't even gotten to uh, even talking about mold sampling. It's all about inspecting for moisture intrusion. Heating, cooling, ventilation. Let's take a look at the air handler, the condensate pump, visible ductwork, number uh, a representative number of registers, air registers, central humidifier, and the central air conditioning unit. Well, it's a heat pump unit on the outside. I want to make sure that it's functioning. There's no major problems with it. There's a disconnect. It's uh, set on a base. It's not damaged, somewhat level. There's the programmable thermostat, great. There's the interior evaporator unit. Um, the large line of an air conditioner unit is called what? The large diameter line. It's insulated, always insulated. The thin line is called what? It's not insulated. Do you know the difference? Do you know the terminology? What's the large line called? So you could answer, if you'd like, with your uh, little feature there in the video. And I'll uh, tell you if you're right or not. What's the thick, large diameter line of an air conditioner unit? You know, what's it called, the insulated one? And what's the thin one called? So I want to make sure that I don't have any problems with the evaporator. So you don't have to do this, but I do. Pull the front panel off of the um, coil, uh, off the evaporator unit of the air handler. I want to see the fins. That's my goal. I want to see fins. Is there any observed indications of dirt there? If there's dirt and a moisture problem, could be a great place for mold growth. And there it is. So I have indications of mold. At least it's dirty, black stuff on the fins. I'm trying to take a good picture of it. It's difficult to take a good picture of the fins. The filter is a great place to look for conditions conducive to mold growth. Um, filters should be replaced. Um, that one's dirty and clogged. Could cause the evaporator coil to um, leak condensate. The air filter can do a lot of things. Um, and there's the condensate drain pipe. Um, and it's going into the perimeter drain. So this is a basement with a floating slab on gravel. And there's a space between the outer edge of the slab floor and the foundation wall. A lot of builders just dump the condensate right there, not realizing that it's not going away. They're just adding gallons of water in a concentrated area in the basement and hoping that it drains or evaporates away. Not sure. Um, the plumbing system needs to be inspected. It's kind of like a home inspection, right? Sampling is just a small part of doing a mold inspection. So we have to inspect anything with water, essentially, right? Main water supply lines, drain lines, hot water source, toilets, tubs, faucets. Um, let's see. So we have Ron asks, do you remove the evaporator cover for a home inspection also? Um, I tend to do so, yes. I actually do. And I wish I had the tool. There's like a six in one, there it is. So there's one of my favorites. This is Stanley, but you can get them. And so um, it's a screwdriver, different heads of the screwdriver. But right there, you can take off the, the screws, bolts, nuts, different sizes. So, and there's my Phillips. There's my flathead. And then there's another fitting there. So um, I forget what the standard size is. Is that a quarter inch? So just take off the front. And... Um, Sometimes I only take off like part of it. A lot of it I can't get off. The lines, suction lines are in the way or evaporator. I mean, the condensate lines are in the way. So I'll just pull a little bit, get my camera in there because I can't get my fat head in there. I take a picture, um, put it on micro, you know, and take another picture and then see what's going on in there. I really like that. You're not required to do. You're not required to exceed the standards of practice. If you exceed the standards of practice as a home inspector or a mold inspector, um, it is expected that you exceed for every client. So if you go over here outside your scope, then the judge is going to say, well, you go outside the scope on every inspection, don't you? You can't limit it. So 
there's um, you're ex opening yourself up to more liability, but I do a better job. So it's a give and take. And um, there's a big debate on that, exceeding the standards of practice, any standards of practice, exceeding it. Um, um, and on our forum, so you can engage with other home inspectors and debate about that online. It's a really good conversation to have with other inspectors. And it's also part of my branding. So I exceed the standards of practice in many ways as a home inspector and mold inspector. One of them, obviously, if you've been here for the beginning of the class, is I walk on the roof. But I'm only trained to do so. If you're not trained or comfortable, do not do anything that you are not comfortable in doing, especially when it relates to safety. Always be safe. Be careful with the electrical panel. Be careful with the water. Be careful with the roof. Even ladders. You could break your leg from the second rung. So careful with tools as well. Just be very careful. And follow the standards of practice, especially if you're new to the inspection business and green and not sure what you're doing. Be very safe. Um, let's see, where are we? We're still visually inspecting, but we're working on the water. Water supplied and water um, drain. There's a water supply coming in. Water source, sometimes the tank leaks, no one knows it, and then any fixtures. So I, I run water at all the bathroom tubs and sinks. I push on the tiles. Did you ever have a, a tile bathroom, a shower? You push on the, excuse me, the tiles. It feels loose. You go to the plumbing access panel behind it. Mold, water, black stuff. You even open it up and it's just... You can just feel it and smell it. Yeah. After you do a thousand of these inspections, you tend to know where to look on some homes. Oh, and one of the tricks of the toilet is um, I try not to touch it. Um, try to wear gloves inside. Often I don't. But you can use your leg. I don't know if you can see. You can use your leg. Put your foot up against the base of the toilet and use your um, bottom part of your leg below the knee to move the toilet to see if it moves should be secured. I'm not trying to move it. I'm just trying to see if it's loose. There's a little tip there. And um, I'm identif identifying tiles that are loose. So these two tiles are loose. I tell my client. I can't tell what's going on behind the wall. At the bottom of a shower door, the slider door, it's a really nasty area. I really don't care what's on the surface, outer surface that could be wiped up. What I'm really caring about is the cracks that allow water to penetrate into the building materials that no one can see. So I'm trying to figure that one out. And if you like, you can use two tools that I really like during a home inspection and a mold inspection. It has everything to do with moisture intrusion and water leaks. Um, that's my infrared camera that I attach to my iPhone, the back of my iPhone. So FLIR has come out with a couple of these. This one's for iPhone. They have one for Droid. And they also have a, that's called C2. It's, it's an infrared camera. It's not a phone, it doesn't attach to a phone, but it's about as big as this, which is really cool. And then it has a nice screen. And um, you follow up every infrared scan, um, thermography scan, with a moisture meter, um, non-invasive, invasive probes, and it gives you an indication. I don't do any quantification of anything. That's my scope. I don't leave that scope. When you quantify things, like tell people about, quantify means give them a number. You measure it and give them a number. Um, you go into a new realm, and you don't want to be an expert in this business. You don't want to be an expert in the inspection industry. You want to stay as a generalist within your scope. You want to quantify. Oh, you want to qualify, not quantify. You want to qualify, see anomalies, odd things, observed indications. I've seen this. When you start to measure, you then start to move towards being an expert, start to quantify things, and you're held to a very high standard as an expert. It's a legal term, so be careful. If you wanna be an expert, great, all for it, but just be careful, you're in a different realm. Um, there's another system and component, an attic, ventilation, insulation. So you go up in the attic space, I crawl up in there. Sometimes they're above the shelf of the bedroom closet, but I'm going in. 
And when I get up there, I take a look at the ventilation and indications of conditions conducive to mold growth <laughs> or observed indications of enter your defect, right? And we do have indications of moisture intrusion. Um, water is, moisture is condensing on the sheathing. Um, probably in the wintertime, there's a cold climate, that sheathing is cold, and the relative humidity in the wintertime is really high in this attic because we have the bathrooms exhausting into the attic. So there's high moisture, um, a warm air, relative humidity is very high, and we have cold surfaces, and those two combined. Um, high relative, uh, high um, relative humidity um, with very low temperatures. It's their opposite. And so you have on the surface of a very cold um, foundation wall down in the basement, remember? Insulation was sticking to it. And also in the attic, we have surfaces, cold surfaces and substrate and moisture and um, high humidity levels. And so we have mold indications of mold growth. Conditions conducive to mold growth and observed indications of mold. And the conditions, there's the roof leak of water stains around that vent pipe that's been poorly patched. So we have water coming in there and we have high, moist, humid, warm air coming from the bathroom vents that are exhausted in the attic. And we have indications of mold growth. So that's all done without sampling. I can confirm my observations as a certified mold inspector by sampling for the mold. And again, as a home inspector, I carry this little swab sample. You can also carry all of your air pumps and dishes and things like that. Or you could tell the homeowner. Maybe it's for a homeowner who's living in the home. You could do the mold sampling yourself. Anybody can sample for mold, really. But if you're hired to do a mold sample, there are standards to follow, code of ethics to abide by, and it's real. if you're a great mold inspector, you're an awesome moisture intrusion inspector. It's all about moisture. And again, graphics. So we have um, moisture condensing on the cold roof sheathing, and we did a graphic about this. Shows you how um, a light or a bathroom fan is exhausted into the attic and how it leaks, and it's a high-definition 3D illustration that members of InterNACHI can download into their inspection reports. You go to natchi.org forward slash gallery. If you can't find these things, you can email me. I'm on the contact page, and I'll help you find it. Um, one of the systems is the interior, and when I find moisture leaks in the attic, I tend to see, I tend to look for moisture at the ceiling where the wall intersects the ceiling. So I'm looking at those areas, and I'm taking pictures as well as I go around. And there's the dryer exhaust. I want to make sure that goes outside. And I also, during a home inspection, I also go um, and take a look at the registers if there's duct work. Oh, awesome. Um, we have an answer. Bill said suction line. That's right. Chuck, suction line, high pressure line. Jay, HP line, suction. Very good. Easy stuff. Um, so, one of the things that I like to do, it's a little dangerous, is I stick my hand on, in the ductwork and pull it out. I wear PPE. Uh, this is when I'm wearing gloves. And I pull stuff out. And it tends to be um, um, revealing. So sometimes in an old home, um, there's wood chips from way back when the house was being built 20 years ago. There's still wood and nails in there. It's never been cleaned. Sometimes I pull that out. Sometimes it's dog hair. Sometimes there are toys in there. Sometimes there are other things in there I don't like to pull out. And I take a picture of it and I tell my client about what I've learned about indoor air quality. I take the in, InterNACHI online, free online indoor air quality course. And now I'm able to tell my client about indoor air quality issues. Take the comfort and climate course. Tell your client about relative humidity condensation, things like that. So it's all about training. Can't go further than what you're trained on. Um, run water at the sink. There's always something nasty going on in an old kitchen sink. And uh, 
new garbage disposal. I run the dishwasher. And then the, um, we have a great article about recirculating fans, hoods over the stoves. Ideally, we want all that stuff to go outside. All the bathroom fans, exhaust, dryer, the kitchen should really be exhausting outside. And then you could take moisture, humidity, and temperature measurements as a moisture, as a mold inspector. Um, and the moisture is really um, what I tend to focus on because that starts the whole ball rolling. Without moisture, you really don't have mold growth. You need that moisture. And if you want to take sampling, well, we made it very easy to decide how to sample a home based upon rooms and conditions and the types of sampling you want to do. So we have a mold sampling decision chart and simply yes or no. So if you have visible apparent mold, you could perform a mold sampling. You want to perform? Yeah, sure. It's up to you. You can do a mold swab or a tape. Um, let's say you have no visible apparent mold growth, but there are visible conditions conducive to mold growth. Well, you can take mold sampling right across the board, any kind of sampling. Indoor air sampling, outdoor air, carpet, and then um, if you don't have any mold growth, observed indications of mold growth, and no conditions conducive to mold growth, your client may say, well, take a sample of the interior air anyways, because you can't see everything. You can only report on things that you observe. You're not required to report on everything visible, just those things that you observe and deem a problem. All right, so we made a mold decision chart for you, and that's in IAC2.org. Oh, um, Mario, do you turn on the dishwasher and inspect it? Yeah, anything that has water, I tend to, I run the shower, I fill up the um, Whirlpool tub, you know, anything that has water running, absolutely, because I think of myself as, instead of a mold inspector, I really think of myself as a mold moisture inspector. <laughs> it's really about water, water intrusion, indoor air quality issues. Mold has everything to do with being a great moisture inspector. Um, not sure what you mean, um, Jay, about suggest. Um, oh, what recommend, what recommendations would you uh, suggest, I get it, for cleaning or removing? Would you put this in your report? Yeah, I just refer to the EPA standards and their recommendations. If it's small, clean it up. You can do it yourself. If it's big, hire someone else to do it. So that's basically what I follow, the 10 square foot rule. And that's fairly like, like this, right? You can just judge it. But with your client, next to me. I want my client with me at all times at any inspection. We're going to see where their level of comfort is. If their eyes are really big and they're freaked out, well, you have to adjust according to your client's needs. They need to be told. Maybe they want to buy a home that is like a, a laboratory, perfectly clean. You have to set their expectations about being a homeowner. Um, homes, did degrade and deteriorate right before your eyes without even doing anything to them. So it's all about the homeowner. Home ownership is a great responsibility. It's all about maintaining the home. And one of the things that really kills a home is moisture. So a mold inspection is really a, an opportunity to educate your client about maintaining the home and with a little focus on moisture intrusion. Um, advanced inspection training. We have an online video course. And it's an excellent course. It's online and free to members. And you click the big blue button and you log in and um, you watch um, a video on mold inspections. Um, we have a moisture intrusion inspector certification program. Training and certification is all online and free to members. We have a, a mold inspector training and certification program that's online and free to members. We have over 30 different certification programs available to members. You join as a member, and then whenever you're ready, 
you choose to be certified. You join and you have access to all the training that we provide. It's online and free. And that whenever you feel ready to be certified, you log into the certification program. At no additional cost, you become certified in over 30 different certifications. Our next free online live class is at that URL, natchee.org forward slash webinar. We used to call them webinars. And we have all of our past webinars and classes at that URL. And that is about it. I don't see any more questions. Um, that was a free online live class. My name is Ben. I'm from Internachi. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. Goodbye, everybody. Talk to you later. See you next class.